the planning board uh, we have a number of items on the agenda tonight I'd like to start with the minutes of the previous meeting for approval everyone's had an opportunity to review the minutes I'd be happy to take a motion so moved <coughs> you have a second moved and seconded all in favor approval of the minutes and that's approved before we move on to the correspondence I would like to extend a welcome to Mr. Peter Cotter who is back joining us and we are all very happy to see you and it hasn't been the same without you so welcome back um, Correspondence we have received, a letter from the Portland Water District regarding paper streets, letter from the town manager regarding paper streets, letter from the town attorney regarding paper streets, letter from the fire chief regarding paper streets, a letter from uh, Deb Alford, and that's regarding the Playstead Park concession stand. A letter from David Sawyer regarding Blueberry Ridge. Um, letter, Maureen, what's this? Letter two. Okay, it looks like we were copied on a letter from Land Use Consultants to Mr. Joseph Fristacci regarding Hamlin Street drainage review. That all the correspondence? Okay. First item on the agenda is on the consent agenda, the Playstead Park concession stand. Uh, as the board knows, if an item's on the consent agenda, if any board member wishes to have any substantive discussion, uh, they should move to remove it from the consent agenda. Uh, I will note that we did receive today a uh, an email from an abutter who had concerns about the concession stand um, for me that would be enough to take it off the consent agenda but I'd like to hear what everyone else thinks I agree I, I think the concerns are perhaps not uh, going to be borne out by what's but what the what they're seeking to do, but I still think we need to have a hearing. Yeah, I, I would agree with that as well. I think okay. given, the, given the letter and what's in it, I think a full airing would be appropriate, and I, I would move that it not be placed on the consent agenda. Okay. Relu um, reluctantly, but, reluctantly, but I think that's necessary. Okay, do I have a motion then? Uh, may I have a question for the, does this need to be put on the workshop agenda or can we go right to a public hearing given that we don't have a workshop in, in well for, first of all I believe we can still discuss it tonight sure. and we can uh, still hear from from the applicant uh, but it would just be off the consent agenda okay so let's see we have a motion to remove it from the consent agenda do we have a second second okay all in favor all right um, we can discuss it we can certainly still discuss it tonight and uh, are you here on behalf of the yes, applicant? I'm Jeff Bump with the Little League. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'd be happy to hear where you are at this point and also oh. if you've had any discussions with the uh, abutters. No, none at all. Okay. No. Um, I think we all knew and we'd always planned, in fact, when we poured the slabs, we, we roughed in the plumbing under the slabs because we all knew that eventually we would want to put a bathroom in. It's all framed. It just, and we even talked about it at the planning board meetings and the, in the town meetings. Um, we're not, the lady that wrote the letter was uh, apparently thinks we're looking to add on, which we're not. It's within the existing building. Right. Um, uh, the bathrooms would be locked all the time, except when there's a Little League game going on. And the letter sounded to me a little like she thought maybe it was going to be a public restroom that was always open. Uh, 
and again one, another reason we want to have that bathroom is so we can get rid of the porta potties which which don't look so great there and the porta potties i think actually i know from working down there they invite traffic to come in and use the porta potty and then go on their way so as far as traffic goes when there isn't a game uh, it should cut down on it and i don't see that having indoor plumbing will increase traffic in any way uh, so I do find uh, uh, that some of her arguments are without validity, at least in my mind. Um, project's coming along well. It's going to we're going to wrap it up the next week in time for the the All Star tournament that's going to be held there. Um, but I do understand that if somebody complains, you probably need to go through the process, and that's fine with us. We weren't intending to have uh, that bathroom hooked up for this big tournament that's coming up anyway. So it, it doesn't really hurt us to wait well, another month. When would you start work on that part of it? When you say it's okay to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're ready. You're ready to go right now. Then. Yeah, we wouldn't. We wouldn't start on that uh, until this tournament is over anyway, because it's just it's, it's too much going on there. Mm -hmm. So we're just trying to clean up the site and have it all safe and looking good by the tournament, which begins a week from Friday. Okay. So j just to be clear then, my understanding is that the, the uh, amendment to the approved site plan doesn't add any doesn't foot add anything. footprint or space. No, it's already in. It's already planned. Uh, on OST's plan, it was already drawn in there, future right. bathroom. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Barbara. Well, I think we have to let people have their say about sure. this, but I would like to go on record as saying that I think the bathroom is incredibly important. And when we talked about it originally, we talked right. about the need for water with serving <coughs> food and the fact that indoor plumbing was a vital necessity if we were going to yeah. put this. Well, the reason and I still am of the same opinion. Yeah, well, we're very happy to be in a position to be able to do a bathroom now. The reason we didn't originally was money. and some anonymous donor came along and said we need to get that bathroom in so that's how we're doing that and then you know we'd love to do the the one up at uh, New Lions eventually too so we can get rid of that porta potty right. it, um, I, I kind of concur with Barbara I'd like to say that if it or ask that if it isn't going to make it an imposition to hold up with this that we maybe get a hearing or something and listen to people, what they say and give them a fair chance to say something. I absolutely agree with you, yeah. sure. No, that way there. Go through the process. I, I think that on the other hand, if, if we discussed it as we are right now and, and had already discussed it, I think the records would show enough. But if somebody has taken the time to write a letter, there may be some other feelings out there that might want to be heard. So I don't know. If it's not going to hurt you, I, nope. I don't have. Right, well. Maybe we should just go to the question of is, is it the sense of the board that we want to table this and have a public hearing or can we discuss it tonight? I mean, I, I'm of I'm a, a little bit both sides of this and the fact that someone did write a letter, although they certainly could have come to the meeting and addressed the issues and we could have, I think, decided it tonight. The fact that they couldn't make the meeting is really what's necessitating us having to put this off a month and have a public hearing, which I'm not sure, so sure is fair to the applicant, but I'm willing to do whatever the board. Thanks, David. I think I've changed my mind about three times since we started this discussion. <laughs> uh, I know the original application was quite clear uh, on the prospect of uh, bathroom facilities. I know we discussed it at length. Uh, we all thought the plan was excellent. I think what's gone up at the field looks great. and. I think this complaint is actually misguided or it's misunderstanding what's being proposed. It's not going to add to the size of the building that we've already approved. Uh, it's really not going to, and I, I think you've addressed the issue of perhaps bathrooms causing a nuisance there. They're going to be locked whenever there isn't a game. I think you're right that the, the chance of people using the porta potties is much greater than the chance of locked bathrooms being an attractive nuisance. So I guess I'd be inclined to, if we can procedurally, go ahead and approve this tonight. Well, we can if that's everyone's wish. Barbara. Perhaps it would be, and I'm certainly willing to withdraw or to have that <coughs> change withdrawn, to have it held off and approve it tonight. 
But perhaps would you be willing to go and see that woman and explain the Oh, sure. Unless she's the one that situation. called the cops on me when I started working too early one morning. And I <laughs> <laughs> well, I think she, my, my sense when I read the letter was she really didn't understand that there Oh, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Or I could but I think her. knowing the bathrooms are going to be locked and you're going to take extra care and get rid of the porta potties, I think that might make her feel better. Okay, then do we have a motion? On, did you make a motion? We didn't vote on Is there a motion? There was a motion. Okay, was it seconded? The table? Okay, well, let's, let's vote on that first. All in favor of the motion at table? Yes. Okay. All in favor of the motion to table. We'll get that out of the way first. Opposed? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Is there another motion? <laughs> Nothing like making a motion and not voting for it. <laughs> That's okay. Everyone's entitled. Is this it? Oh, that's it. Yeah. I'll venture a guess here. I, can I, I just say one thing? Board to consider. Uh, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials previously submitted to the, and the facts presented, the application to the town of Cape Elizabeth to amend the site plan for the concession plan at Placedead Park, located at Shore Road and Old Fort Road, to add a bathroom and connect the building to public water and sewer be approved. Second? Second. <laughs> Moved and seconded. All in favor? Abstaining. Opposed? None. One abstention? Okay. That carries. Thank you. Thank you. Is this, this isn't contingent on me no. smoothing it. Okay. I don't want you to get yourself in trouble. I, mean, I appreciate it very much. But. <laughs> Thank You're you. You're all set. <laughs> All right, uh, under old business, the uh, Hamlin Street subdivision, this is a request for subdivision review. Uh, this is scheduled tonight for a public hearing as well. And first, if we can hear from the applicant as to where we are in the present time. Again, my name is Steve Blaze with Pink McGreer. I'm here tonight with Alan Burnell. Um, I'm an engineer with our company. Alan's a soil scientist and licensed site evaluator. We're here tonight for Michael Cloutier um, for the amendment to the Hamlin Street subdivision. I thought I might do a recap for the public. Um, would that make sense? Yes, anyway, thank you. Okay. Um, basically, what we have, what Mike has purchased out here today, um, is uh, 22 lots. They're about 50 feet each in width. There's actually four of them that are that are less, that are 40 feet. Um, they're about 100 feet deep on average. Uh, one tenth of an acre lots, uh, pretty small lots. Um, what we're proposing to do with this amendment is to combine these lots um, and to make a less dense development with nine lots that are roughly about a quarter acre each. Um, this will give it a nice. Um, the, uh, this will be a nice small neighborhood. We'll have a nice small neighborhood neighborhood feel. We do have uh, narrower streets which are 22 feet wide with Cape Cod burn um, as curbs. Um, the homes will be uh, towards the front of, of the lots and um, 
there's a sidewalk. We're proposing a five foot wide sidewalk along the length of the street um, with an esplanade separating it um, with uh, uh, planted with street trees. As you can see here in the section, that's about what it'll look like. Um, Um, the town did ask us to improve the roadway um, beyond uh, this, what Michael owns. Um, he owns the land starting here. Um, so what we're proposing to do is we're going to upgrade the, uh, an existing part of Stevenson Street, about 150 feet of Stevenson Street, and also about um, 400 feet of Hamlet Street. So what's existing out there today, about an 18-foot wide gravel roadway will become, um, will be brought up to town standards and become a pub public roadway. I should make a real nice roadway. The, um, the power, power will be underground. Um, drainage will be collected in catch basins um, and discharged uh, at two different points. Um, the upper part here will be discharged up above these wetlands. And this lower section here will be collected and discharged just downhill of the roadway here. Um, so all in all, the roadway is about 1,000 feet from the intersection of Stevenson Street to the end of the Hammerhead here. Um, we, uh, we do have a, in, in order to minimize disturbance during construction, um, there, there will be a lot of, there will be some blasting required for this um, development. We will come up with a blasting plan. Um, we will submit that and um, if the board um, would like us to. And um, we also came up with an erosion control plan to minimize any sedimentation off of the construction area. Um, we have worked uh, closely with the town, um, and in that we've had a workshop. Um, we've met with um, uh, the town staff, the town engineer, who is Steve Harding, and also um, Bob Malley, the uh, public works director. Um, in, in one of our meetings, what we discussed, my, my first submission actually, um, I tried to keep the culvert, uh, the major culvert here, um, the same size, 18 inches. Um, but what we found with the, the huge amount of area that's actually draining to that culvert, um, what's happening in the existing condition today is the roadway's overtopping. Um, and uh, Bob Malley and Steve Harding indicated that in order for this to be a town road and be up to town standards, we can't have it overtopping in a 25-year storm event. So they did ask me to look at a bigger pipe size um, and, and to lower it to see if we could make that roadway still passable in a 25-year storm event. I did look at that, and I did successfully come up with a solution, which is a 24-inch culvert. That's about a foot to a foot and a half lower than the 18-inch culvert is today. Now, since then, there's been some uh, concerns raised about the existing, there's an existing ponding area on the upper side of this culvert. Um, and uh, the concern was, is that going to go away? Um, and the only reason that pond's there today is because that 18-inch culvert is up higher lowering that wood drain the pond. That was our answer. Um, but more importantly, our, our solution to the, to the, uh, our way of keeping that pond, we're going to construct a, uh, it's a small wall just upstream of the, of the pipe, of the new pipe, um, and we'll match the existing covered ele elevation with that wall. Basically what we're doing is we're, we're going to keep the existing pond, but when the largest storms come, uh, the runoff will overtop that wall and get into the culvert and, and pass the roadway. So the roadway is still passable in a 25-year storm event, and the existing ponding will remain. That's what that comes down to. Um, uh, we did, uh, last Tuesday, we met with the Conservation Commission to explain this plan and, and how, it, um, how we're working. We will disturb some wetlands here um, in improving this culvert, um, and that's basically just to make a town roadway, to make it up to the standard. Um, we will not be disturbing any wetlands in this area here. Um, so changes um, since the last submission, since we last spoke. Um, we've provided, um, Maureen asked us to provide more information on the uh, RP1 designation here uh, on this wetland. Um, basically, we need to know the size of this wetland um, and you know, it runs further down here. We, we have looked at that and we have submitted that. That's in your, uh, should be in your packets. Um, so we provided that. Um, as far as the tree types, uh, we had some trees that weren't quite the, the right type of trees. I think they were uh, swamp oak. We've changed those to green ash. So there's going to be green ash and red maples along this roadway, kind of alternating. Um, 
there were a few minor things as far as materials, roadway materials, using the right gravel and the right uh, surface coats. We've revised that. And um, the existing four inch sanitary sewer that services, I believe, this home here, um, uh, Steve Harding thought it would be a good idea to upgrade that to the eight inch. We were planning on that, um, and we've shown that more clear, clearly on the plan now. So the four inch main uh, sewer here will be removed, and then eight inch will be servicing that lot. Um, since, our, since the submission you have in front of you today, there were a few more comments, um, uh, pretty minor. Um, the uh, police chief uh, has requested that we, we name this something different than Hamlin Street uh, for safety reasons, um, in case that gets continued. Um, and uh, we will definitely do that. We're actually coming up with names now. Uh, the way that works, we have to submit to the, we have to have that approved by the police chief and also um, uh, the assessor. Um, Steve also uh, would like us to add a, an easement here through lot one. There is a culvert in this area to drain the low spot here um, towards the wetland. So we'll provide a, um, an easement through lot one for that. We've already accounted for that, for this drainage in this area. There's a perfectly buildable lot to the right side of that. Um, also, uh, capacity letters. I have spoken with, uh, with the Portland Water District and also the Public Works. So we have uh, plenty of water, plenty of sewer capacity. I just need to get that paperwork from them. Um, they do know that my request is coming. Um, and finally, um, lot seven and eight um, for foundation drains. Uh, Steve Harding is concerned about foundation drains spilling out over the curb and causing icing conditions in the wintertime. So what we're pro proposing to do on that, what Steve would like us to do is to just tie that in to the under drains that we'll have in the roadway. Um, so um, that kind of wraps up uh, the, the, the majority of the comments that, that we need to address. Um, uh, we do feel these are pretty minor. Um, and uh, basically, we're, we're excited to, to get this project, uh, to, to make it a reality. We think it'll be a real, real nice project. Um, so any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Questions from the board before we have the public hearing? Barbara. I seem to have missed the part in the packet that definitively discusses the RP1 wetland. I'm still not clear whether it connects to the rest of the wetland or whether there's a stream or whether it's greater than 1.6 acres. I think it's 1.6. Can you tell me where in here that was? Because I apparently missed it. We, we submitted that with the last one, yeah. Um, it just shows a larger area here. You, yeah. you don't. But my understanding was that you were supposed to do some more work to determine oh, since whether last or not Tuesday? it was exact was more than two acres. Right. Um, that that has not been submitted yet. There oh, is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I thought maybe I missed something in the packet. Thank you. No, no. That's. We we have done that work, however, and um, we will be submitting that by the next deadline. Is what we were hoping to do, um, unless it became a condition to an approval tonight. Yeah, so on that issue, wh what is it you have done to answer that question one way or the other, and when will we? I understand from Maureen that we got something just tonight. Yes, um, that was just, um, instead of putting in the mail to Maureen, we handed it to her. Um, uh, basically, uh, we, we didn't want to submit new information uh, two days before the, before the meeting here. So um, the... the um, the question here was: um, We did supply more, uh, provide more information on this on this wetland, um, but what what we needed to do it, it was uh, it's shown connected to the there's a pond here in this area. It's shown connected to that today, and um, basically, uh, I might actually turn to Alan here if he doesn't mind because he's the expert in this. Um, let me go. I could try my best, but then you might still have questions. When we went to the Conservation Commission, um, after the last planning board meeting, um, um, Maureen had asked that 
we show more of the total. This is the total wetland that you're looking at here, if you, if you can see it. This is the total wetland now. Uh, I think what we had presented to you before was showing the wetland uh, about up to this point. Um, and, and that was, I had done all of the work before, we just hadn't presented it right. And when we went to the Conservation Commission um, and talked at a meeting with the Conservation Commission, they asked me to go back and look at this area. This is the pond, the little, the little man-made pond by the, um, the greenhouse that's here. And I had shown this area connected to the pond. This, it, and you can just barely see it in this photograph. There's, there's, a, there's, there's an outlet to this pond that runs into this wetland. I quite frankly wasn't quite sure what to do with that, so I, I had included it in this wetland. And because I wasn't totally sure what the, so I figured I would err, err on the uh, side of conservative, being conservative. And at the Conservation Commission, it was suggested that perhaps I wanted to go back, I might want to go back and look at this and see if in fact it was, if there was any wetland associated with a stream or if it was a stream. So subsequently I did, and this is what we came up with. This is a stream um, that drains this, this pond. There really is no associated wetlands with it. It's channelized, it's a very near, narrow three foot channel. Uh, it, so it carries the water from this pond down to the wetland. When it gets to this point right in here, it becomes so ill-defined that you cannot follow the thread of the stream. Uh, this is a, quite a steep gradient. Um, it's channelized, has a mineral bottom, um, all of the things that you use when you look at defining a stream. Um, it made a difference of about um, three hundredths or three tenths of an acre maybe or something like that when I subtracted it. Um, this now this I left it I, I had the RP1 zone mapped at 1.4 acres it actually came out to 1.41 acres when we took this area out of it it came out to be 1.39 acres so it was it was a wash so I left it at 1.4 acres so now the RP1 zone which is this area in here is 1.4 acres which is what it was before there's a little area of RP2 in here that's about a half an acre and then this, this, this area out here is in the neighborhood of an acre and a half. There's about four acres of wetlands here total. So that was, that was the process that we went through, or I went through anyways, and that's what we have here now. I'll be glad to answer any questions as yeah, far as the wetlands. Yeah, I, I have some questions, Mr. Brown. What, what is it you did? I understand that you provided the map, and, and you said that you initially included that area all the way up to the pond. Right. Other than changing your interpretation, what else did you do between including it and now not including it? Well, I, I really didn't do anything. Um, I just didn't know what to do with it. If, if I had, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a stream. <clears throat> Um, so, so, as I said, I wasn't sure quite what to do with it, whether to map it as a wetland or whether not to map it as a wetland. Um, so that's why I showed the wetland up there um, the first time around, because I, I really wasn't quite sure what to do with it. Um, there is no associated wetland with the stream. The stream is about three or four feet wide. Uh, it's channelized. Um, it's about two, two and a half feet deep. Um, there is no floodplain that goes with it. The water comes out of the pond, runs through that channel very quickly. The, the gradient is very steep, and then runs into that runs into that wetland. Uh, and that was that was simply I didn't quite know what to do with it, so I threw it in as in, in as well. But so so it's it's your contention then that even if that were included, that would not change the total area of the wetland. To over two acres? Um, it, it wouldn't change the area of this wetland, okay? Well, what, what wetland would it change? Then? It would change, if this is connected to this wetland, we were told at the Conservation Commission, then if this is in fact connected to this wetland here, then we're over the two acre threshold. Right. Which, which would lead to a fairly significant redesign of, of the project. Uh, it would eliminate the project. Well, 
That's even more significant. Then. That, that's what I'm just saying. Yes. Okay. But so that's, I'm agreeing. So it's 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 a it's an important issue, and I guess it, I'm just yes, trying yes. to figure out how you went from one conclusion to the other. Whether you did any additional work, or you just uh, no decided. Uh, no, I didn't do anything different. Any different? I knew it was there. Like I said, I just wasn't. I didn't know what to do. With it. There was a difference, which I guess. The difference in interpretation is, is, is a stream a wetland? Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions on this issue? I, I mean, I, I'm a little bit at a loss to try to figure out whether it's over the two acres or under the two acres based on what you've provided us because it doesn't sound like there really was anything additional done to uh, make that determination one, one way well, or the other. I'm certainly not qualified to right. the, interpret the data on my own, but we need to know that, obviously. Right. And I, and, I, and I agree. And, and, and this is what was pointed out to the Conservation Commission is that we should go back and look at this because um, there has been other, this, this wetland has been mapped before, and the, origi the, the original wetland is the, this wetland is the wetland that was mapped be before is similar to this one as it is now. And I would also have to point out that I have never, I have not gone to the town office to look at either before or after or since. I have not gone to the town office and looked at the wetland as it is mapped. Mm -hmm. Um, when I did this the first time, um, I, uh, I, Maureen informed me that this had been looked at before in, in a previous project. I set out to go look at that map, and then I said, no, the best thing that I can do is I need to make the call on my own, so, that I, so I did make the call on my own. Maureen, what, what is the prior information, if any, on mapping that what? Um, it was the... There's the lot next door, and if you if you look at that map, the lot from underneath this project is a very large lot that came before the board, starting in the that, late that would, 1980s. That would be um, yes, and um, there's a large wetland that basically runs parallel to Spurwink Ave, and the applicant attempted to propose a development that would have access onto Spurwink Ave. They showed a wetland there that was designated as RP1 with a buffer, and there was no room to create a new row outside of the RP1 and the RP1 buffer. So that project, the end, the making a uh, very long story short is that project never was approved. Um, but we do have the wetland mapping in-house, and when this project came in and showed that the adjacent wetland was not RP1 but RP2, it was inconsistent. Um, that doesn't mean that this mapping was accurate and the, uh, wasn't accurate or inaccurate, but we went to the applicant and we said, we need you to go back and do a good job mapping this wetland and justify your designation because we have some conflicting information in-house. The applicant did that, um, but at this point, there, and I, if I show you this, the project's up here, and, and if Mr. Brunel will forgive me, I think the further away he got from the project, um, especially when he got down at this point, he probably was being um, a little bit more summary in your judgment. And um, yeah, somewhat, yes. Right, so when you get down to this point, probably be saying, okay, I know it's over an acre, I know it's an RP1, and he stopped at the edge of the pond, not realizing that in Cape Elizabeth, we protect ponds under our wetlands regulations. We say that if you dig at the bottom of the pond, you'll find very poorly drained soils. Therefore, if you touch this pond, you're automatically picking up enough additional acreage that you kick this entire wetland into the 250-foot buffer category. So at that point, we suggested to Mr. Bunnell that he really take a second look at that connection, because we really didn't think there was a, a wetland that extended all the way to the pond. Our mapping from the prior project showed the, the RP1 wetland cutting off about here. Uh, Mr. Brunel explained that there was an actual stream connection, and if you look at these um, aerial photos, you can see the stream connection. Um, but if it's not a stream with associated wetlands, if it's a stream that has a banks on either side and all it has is water flowing through it, we don't call it a wetland. Um, 
and therefore what happens and what we're being told is what happens at this point is that the stream becomes a very channelized flow into the pond and therefore the RP1 wetland stops before it gets to the pond. If it stops before it gets to the pond, the total a contiguous acreage of RP1 wetland is 1.4 acres. Is that clear? Well, you don't have it's, this in your it's packet. Clear. It's just handed it to me tonight. Dave. What, what I'm gathering from all of this is that perhaps tonight we don't have enough information on the wetlands mapping issue, and that in order for this application to proceed, they're going to have to give us some definitive answers, because right now there's enough doubt that this couldn't be a, approved at all. Um, so it would seem to make sense to table this till the next month's hearing so they could come back and follow up on some of the comments and suggestions you've made, Maureen. Well, I believe the applicant... I've already spoken to Steve Blaze regarding uh, my recommendation that this needs to be tabled after this public hearing, and I believe the applicant is, is amenable to that. Oh. Yeah, I, I think there are a few. So, um, but you, Mr. Brown, you, so you understand that then that we, yeah, we do no, need something yeah. definitive. Well, I appreciate the fact that there may be some older mapping, and but when I hear the applicant say it goes up to the pond and then say it doesn't go up to the pond, I, I'd like to know. Right, and I understand that, and, and that's one of the reasons why we. I mean. We, I did this last week. We decided not to submit it because we didn't think it was appropriate to submit something to you two days before and have you digest it. But, but that's essentially what I, what I wanted to do was explain the process that, that I went through. I'm fairly confident, as confident as I can be after 16 years of doing this, that this, map, that, that this, is, this mapping is correct. And um, I have all of the supporting information. I would be glad to go back here and take some pictures uh, of the of the outlet to the pond and submit it so that you can take a look at it. That might be a good idea. Okay. Um, yes. No. What? No. I, that's what's confusing. This this uh, was submitted a couple of today or a couple of days ago. And it, as you can see, it stops prior to the pond, whereas the prior drawing. Thus, the confusion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's quite difficult. I understand. And like I said, we, I didn't, we didn't do, we didn't do this on purpose. Well, we did do it on purpose, but we didn't, and we weren't trying to confuse the issue. I just didn't think that it was proper. I mean. But I've been on planning boards before, and people have walked in and said, "Sure, here." And I appreciate that. It's just you, right, you exactly. pointed to that map and said high confidence, and I'm looking at it as if it's this one. Yeah, sure. that's not helpful to your case. Right. So now I understand. But if you take the two, you can see the difference between the. And it I essentially, is this little area yeah. here. I, and, and I will be glad to go back, and I will go back. The fog is lifting. I, I, I'm going to put take some away. pictures of the stream. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, other questions of the applicant before we open the public hearing? I guess I have another one. Uh, Mr. Blaise, have you had an opportunity to see the June 3rd letter from Land Use Consultants? Uh, just now. Um, okay. Just as I walked in. I did... Uh, okay. All right, well, I, 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 I did go through those. And, uh, uh, don't have any big disagreements um, with any of the comments, actually. The first one, um, I don't think there's any in the paragraphs up above. He's just describing it. Um, he's saying that there is, um, I believe this was Dave Camilla, right? Yeah. Um, he was saying that there's some fill, some significant fill in this area, and that is true. Um, the reason for the large amount of cut and fill on this project is uh, it's fairly steep going up there. Um, those of you that walked the site um, probably, you know, I was winded when I got to the top, uh -huh. but I don't hike much. Um, but there will be some cut in this area and some fill here. There's, there's no other way to do it without meeting, you know, in order to meet the roadway standards. It's the only way you can do it. Um, as far as, um, uh, so under number one, um, 
the drainage easement he's speaking of is, is right here on this pipe inlet. We will need an easement here. So that what's the, town, the status of that? Um, we're actually working on that. I think Mike has a phone call in, or you've talked to him, haven't you? Okay, so that hasn't been that hasn't works. been finalized yet. Uh, All right. What we're hoping for is a, to have an agreement before the July 2nd uh, submittal deadline. Um, so number two again is um, the significant amount of fill. Um, but more importantly on that one is the culvert. Um, this culvert here, um, what uh, David's saying in his letter is that needs to be checked um, as it's constructed on site to make sure that we're draining. There's a low spot on this side of the roadway to make sure that's positively draining this way. It's hard to set an invert on it in design-wise unless you actually go and, and spot shot everything out there. So that will be something we'll be overlooking as it's uh, constructed. Um, number three, um, if we do, if we do, um, if Mr. Prastashi decides to build on this lot, this roadway is up about five feet, is what he's saying. Um, on this side of it, actually, as you go up the street right here, it's about at grade, so it would be a, an okay place for a driveway. Um, the only way to bring in a public road here is to have it above grade so that you can meet your vertical curve uh, requirements. So that's just, um, that's just the way it is, just a part of design. Um, so that's the best answers I can give to okay. that. Thank you. If there aren't any other questions right now, maybe we can open the public hearing. All right, public hearing's open. If anyone wishes to trust the board, please step forward and state your name and address. We'd be happy to listen to you. My name is uh, Russ Tornrose, Holly Tornrose, my wife. And we live at 5 Hamlin Street, which is the, where is it? It's the house that uh, is right beside the subdivision and also abuts the uh, small pond that we were talking about. And I believe the board received last year a, um, uh, last year, last week, a, a uh, memo or a copy that I had sent to um, Maureen about uh, basically outlining our concerns. So I'll just kind of briefly hit on those. I think some of them have been answered from tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, we had basically three concerns. Uh, the primary one was the impact of the project, um, particularly the lowering of the culvert on the pond right beside our home. And we've lived uh, beside this pond for some time. And on a daily basis, we're very much aware of the variety of life that the kind of habitat that is there and the life that that supports. We have uh, a nesting pair of black ducks at this time. We have a lot of uh, aquatic life that is there, and it's, it's been a great place to watch. And I know that were that pond to be, be dropped, and I don't know as um, wildlife <clears throat> has any um, uh, voice or rights before the board, but it would just, I feel, it would be a tragedy not to try to preserve that habitat if we could do that. So we were really uh, concerned about the lowering of the culvert, and uh, we also believe that the pond is kind of a unique uh, feature. It has a lot of blooming wildflowers there that would be important to, to preserve. Um, <clears throat> I think our concerns were answered with the uh, installation of the weir-type barrier that was, that was described, and it uh, appears to be addressed in that re revised plan, but I would like myself to just kind of, and I look forward to better understanding the proposed design of this wall and uh, seeing just how it interfaces with the pond. Uh, our second issue was on the road design. Uh, we had described the road as kind of, um, we're used to living on a gravel road. I always have lived on small country roads. And uh, we were concerned somewhat about the width and the straightness of it and the whole idea of uh, living with a, a sidewalk. We would have pre uh, preferred, of course, uh, uh, maintaining a narrow gravel road, but we understand that um, that there are standards that the town has in order to make this town road and that that is going to change, particularly within the limits of the right-of-way. And so it's something that we uh, simply have accepted uh, that is going to change for us. Uh, our last concern is the preservation of the wetland, particularly in this area. We've done a lot of hiking in this area. We've become very kind of intimately connected to it and see it as kind of a, a really unique ecosystem. And I know I don't need to preach to you about the importance, just from what I've heard tonight, 
about the reasons for preserving whatever wetlands we do have that are left. Um, I think, or I believe, that it's a, a national priority and that any project that we have, even small subdivision projects, really need to take the mapping of wetlands um, seriously and map those areas carefully. I've walked this stream all the way down from Maxwell's Pond um, and to the marshland and through the marshland all the way down to uh, Trout Brook. And it is pretty amazing to take that walk because of the, both the changing nature of the wetland uh, from Maxwell's down to Trout Stream. It's, it's a very kind of dramatic scene. There are vegetation changes along the way and there is animal habitat and there are animals that actually use that carta. That is a, a kind of an open uh, carta that is being used. So I think it's very important to maintain the, the kind of integrity of that area. Right behind our house there is a deep stand of uh, marsh cattail that runs in the field right behind our home right up to the small pond. So I'm not a soil scientist so I can't suggest exactly how that area should be designated. Um, whether it should be an RP1 or an RP2, but I just hope that the mapping of the uh, requested areas is done very, very carefully and thoroughly, no matter what the consequence. Um, I, I, I believe it's an important issue. I believe it's a moral issue. So, thanks for listening. Thank you. you want to say I, okay. I had really prepared to, uh, to speak, but I guess I want to... Um, uh, support the questions that were going on particularly from the chair about how the change in how the wetland was determined. Um, we had the same map that apparently you had and um, Russ can picked it up earlier today and you know it seems to me that it's almost just like um, that was a complicated or complication that was unexpected or unknown about the how the wetland uh, the ramifications for determining the wetland going up to the uh, Maxwell's Pond, and it seems that it was an easy, um, perhaps, adjustment to the original plan, and that, um, that does raise some concern for me. Um, the fact that the soil scientist um, presented here tonight and said, well, perhaps someone else would classify this as being a wetland, I find particularly concerning. It seems like it's a little bit, um, how do you want to interpret? And there wasn't, it seemed to be much done in terms of um, actual process of determining, rather than just reclassifying how one interprets the, the same data. Um, which then, I guess I don't really know, but I wonder about what the board has the power to request in terms of alternative perspectives or other people um, looking at that land other than um, the same uh, person. I don't know if there's a way to require some other kind of judgment or, and I hate to ask you all to go out once again to our neighborhood for another, yet again, another site walk to some other area of our neighborhood, but it does make me wonder about um, how the data is being collected, how it's being interpreted, and whether it's really an objective judgment that's being made, because obviously if the subdivision is to go in, um, you know, that has a, um, a financial um, benefit to people who are trying to put it in. So anyway, thank you for your concerns and your questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm a little out of practice. I know. Um, my name is Joe Fastaggi, and together with Star Homes, we own three lots that represent about 410 feet along the northerly or north easterly side of this uh, proposed subdivision. We have several concerns, and land use consultants have provided me with a letter which addresses these concerns. Um, but tonight, I've heard in the presentation made by the applicant, I, I have another concern that, that really disturbs me. Um, I am in support of the project. Um, please don't, don't misunderstand my uh, presence here tonight. But I do have some concerns, and I discussed this with the applicant uh, last week. Um, and went over the 
concerns outlined with the land use consultant's letter. Chairman brought up the amount of fill that's going to be required on the last lot of, of star homes. It's been discussed that it's five feet, um, five feet fill on the road. That's probably correct, but on the lot itself, it's more like nine, eight or nine feet. The <coughs> lot is, is two feet lower than the road, and when you build a house, you have to build up. So that represents uh, quite an expense for uh, star homes, and as the letter says, to, to make this a buildable lot, it, it represents quite an expense. We find that there's a drainage culvert on this lot, um, and uh, this, again, is a concern of ours. The other concern is what you have, the information that you have in your packet describes an easement on the first lot, which I own. That's right here. I've never been approached for an easement, nor am I inclined to, to give an easement for this property, um, mainly because of the amount of water that's being discharged on it. Tonight I hear that the storm drain is going to be collected from the high point, run down the street, and again discharged to my property. This this seriously bothers me, so I would implore you to make sure that there's some type of relief for this particular lot, Trout Brook, and whatever else is represented downstream. That just about represents my, my concerns. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the board? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, further questions? Dave. Just have a question for the town planner in response to one of the comments we got <clears throat> during the public hearing. Uh, I'm not aware of the board ever having ordered a wetland survey, it's, survey itself to kind of test the credibility of the applicant's submission. Um, have members of the, well, A, can we do that? And B, can uh, abutters go out and get their own survey and submit that as evidence for the board? I just want to try to give guidance to some of the people that have spoken tonight. One, the board does have the authority to uh, require a peer review. Uh, you can require that the applicant pay for you to hire uh, your independent wetlands analyst to go out and do a wetland survey. Uh, does that answer that question? The second one is the board has done that on, I think, two different occasions that I can think of. It's very rare, but you have done it. And third, on one of those occasions, not only did the planning board hire their own expert, but the abutters also hired their own expert and provided information to the board on what their wetland expert had come up with. So, yes, you can do it. What is the, uh, what would be the expense of a survey for this area, this amount of area? I'm wondering if Mr. Bunnell might be able to tell us ballpark estimate of what it would cost. Well, it, it depends, yeah, it depends on whether you're having somebody review prior data and work and give an interpretation or whether you want somebody to start from the beginning and do their own survey. So you were speaking survey. in terms of a peer we, review? We have a budget okay. to do such work. And if I can add my view to this, um, that's kind of where I was going with this because I'm, I'm un to be honest with you, I'm uncomfortable with the fact that uh, the initial wetland designation that came from the applicant themselves went down to the pond and whether they realized it or not created a condition that that would not have allowed this project to go forward. After that was pointed out, perhaps by the town planner, the uh, boundary did change and that may very well be the proper boundary but it certainly raises question in my mind that I feel we are uh, bound to, to follow up on and get an answer one way or the other. And I would still invite 
the applicant to submit their information, additional information. Um, but, uh, Maureen, I would like, if, if the board agrees and we vote to do so, uh, perhaps engage someone to, to confirm that information. But I'd be interested to hear from everyone else. Well, Peter. It seems to me we, we would want the applicant's sort of final word on that area before we even began to put it out to our own peer review. Is that possible between now and the next meeting? The applicant has submitted me a new plan tonight. Right. So I, I think based on that, you could go out tomorrow and hire yourself an expert to go in and verify this. Well, and also I believe, to be fair, Mr. Brunel said he had some additional backup mm -hmm. information. So submit whatever you have to the planner. And uh, the more information we have, the better. Are you making a distinction between a peer review of what's been submitted versus a totally independent analysis? Well, th there is a distinction. I, I'm not sure we've decided what, what we want to do. Um, I see that distinction as someone looking, they don't gather their own information, they look at the information that's been gathered and given interpretation, right. as opposed to someone who starts from the beginning, gathers their own information, right. perhaps does their own soil, soil testing. Soil testing so. um, but we can discuss which if we want to go that direction, what we would like them to do. I was thinking something more in between where the question areas that we have is where we get the independent data gathering, but obviously right. we still want a review of everything, so to speak. Anyone else like to address that? I don't mean to. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Peter. The reasons we discussed earlier, I need to leave the podium for the remainder of the evening. Okay. Any other comments on that particular issue? John. Yeah, David. Uh, I'd kind of like to echo what Peter just said. Perhaps the uh, peer review could be for the entire study, but that we have somebody look at the area in dispute, if you will, which is, I believe, the stream bed or mm -hmm. that might connect to the pond. Mm -hmm. I think that would be the area that would, I'd be the most interested in getting raw data on. I mean, do we need a formal motion to do this? Or? If that's the consensus of the board, I don't think you need a motion. But my understanding is you, you want me to retain a wetland expert on behalf of the planning board um, to review all of the wetland information submitted by the applicant, but to do an independent review of the uh, pond and whether or not there's a connection between Maxwell Pond and the RP1 wetland. Exactly. And is this something that the board wants to pay for out of planning board study funds, or do you want to build the applicant for that? Which you are authorized to do. What's, what's the budget? It's, what's the budget? it's not much. Not much. Well, it seems to me the peer review would be uh, clearly chargeable to the applicant. I'm just, uh, no, I, I'm sympathetic to it to not charging them, but at the same time, we're still waiting for their data. So for us to, to begin to figure out where we, an appropriate allocation would be without having their final, you know, information. Um, I, well, to me, it's an, e it's an easy decision. <laughs> the, the applicant has given us uh, two different Fair. sets of information. We need to determine which one is correct on an issue that will it's critical. could potentially mean that the project can't be built. So I think it's an expense yeah. the applicant should bear. Mr. Chairman, if I could interject something, um, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, uh, Mr. Budal, I, sorry, you have to go up to the podium because of the uh, recording. Um, I don't have a problem with that at all, um, with working with somebody. Uh, as a matter of fact, if I, mean, I I would be glad to go out and contact some wetland scientists um, and um, shepherd them through the process, uh, take them out there, have a look at it, um, and uh, you know, do whatever um, it, you, whatever has to happen. I, I'm not comfortable with it, so I don't have a problem with that at all. 
Um, and as, as I said, I will, um, I can contact some wetland scientists, pick one that's agreeable to Maureen or the board, uh, and we can go out and take a look at it if, if that's what you'd like to do. And then I can get them to submit a report or their findings. Right. Well, we, we appreciate that, but I think, I think the way to do it is we'll retain someone on behalf of the board. I think that's the way we have to do it. And obviously, if they need information from you, uh, I'm, I sure you'll be, I'm sure you'll be cooperative. I'm sure you'll be process a little bit. I know several of them. Like I said, I just would take a list and have Maureen pick one that was suitable to them. But that's fine. Yeah, well, we, we certainly know enough wetlands scientists, so I bet we could find one. Can we choose someone who's really sort of outside this work area? Yeah, we, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, all right. Uh, there was one other issue, again, just so the applicants are aware, uh, buffering between lots 4, 5, and 6 in the RP2 wetland. Does that ring a bell? Steve, the need for a buffer between lots four, five, and six, and the RP2 wetland at the rear of the, those lots. Um, yeah, the conservation did raise that, that concern about um, how we would keep people from going into those wetlands in the future. Right. Um, the way uh, the way we looked at these lots, um, I did grade them all out with potential houses in there, just so Mike would have a feeling what he's going to have to sell. Um, the way these are going to play is, is these the people that own lots four, five, and six are going to have a fantastic buffer in their backyard. Um, it's not going to be a traditional backyard type of lot. It's going to be more of a you have your porch, a little bit of a cleared area, and then an excellent buffer. You're, you're in nature. I mean, it'll be we feel it'll be a selling point more than having a nice open lawn. Um, we did discuss the the uh, option of maybe putting in some. I think Maureen had uh, mentioned some previous projects they had put in. Uh, fences at the corners of the of the wetland, um, with an opening in the middle, just so that people would know there's the wetland and it, it's permanent. We're we're uh, we're agreeable to do that if if that is uh, if that makes the board feel more comfortable and you know, the conservation commission feel more comfortable that those lots won't be um, expanded in the future. We would also have a note on the uh, on the plans when these people buy the lots. We'll place a note on the plan that says. In order to disturb any wetlands on these lots, you have to file for a resource protection permit, or I believe that's what it's called here um, in Cape Elizabeth. So they, they would know that from the get-go. Um, so okay. we, we do offer those two. Barbara. Well, while we're on this, <clears throat> I'm not clear where the building envelopes are for four, five, and six. Um, it's the orange. Those are the building Yeah, Yeah, um, the, the lighter green here is, is uh, setbacks, required setbacks off your side yards, front yards. And, um, you know, the, the, the wetland is this different color green here, so. Other questions? Go right ahead. Excuse me. Mr. Frisashi brought up the fact that uh, of the draining onto his land from a potential pooling of water. Can you make that somewhat clearer? And is there any way of that culvert being anywhere but there so it was on your land entirely and not running into somebody else's? Uh, okay. You're referring to this culvert here, I believe, which yes. would require an easement. Yes. And uh, if there is a way um, to have that culvert there without an easement by constructing a wall, we just construct the wall right here. Um, with probably would have to have a fence on top of it, so it would be safe. Um, but we could pull that back onto our property. And it doesn't really, it's not the best solution, but if we cannot get that easement, that's what we would have to do. What is the difference if it's entirely on your property? I, I, it would still function the range. same, um, basically because the roadway's in some fill here, you need, you need to tie back into your grade, and then the pipe is at the bottom of that grade. 
So your grade, you know, if your roadway's up here, your grade's going along here, and there's your culvert off your property. It's just the, the way the road grades out, and that's why the culvert ends where it does uh, in, into the property. Um, that is where the drainage is. That's where the culvert has to go. There's a, I don't know if you remember, the site walk was a little challenging crossing through here because it was wet. It, it doesn't drain very well today, um, but we're putting in a roadway. We're going inter to intercept any drainage that's going on there. So uh, that's why there's a culvert to let that water keep going where it's going today. Isn't I did wonder why it was a culvert. I wondered why it couldn't be in a different place. <clears throat> um, it, it couldn't be this way or that way because the drainage runs like that. Um, well, I guess what I was saying is we could pull the front of it back and receive the water more this way, but then we'd have to put in a wall. Uh, I'm not so sure Public Works would want to maintain a wall in that area. The best solution is to, I believe, is the way it is now. Um, I guess what I was trying to do is, even if it's extreme, I was trying to tell you what other options there were. I, I was going to follow up on that before Barbara asked another, a different question. I thought I thought that e that drainage easement was more northerly. Isn't uh, you're pointing to? This, I just don't see that on the plan though. This, the other one he's talking about. There, there's a culvert here, and there's a culvert here. But the plan doesn't show an easement on the more southerly one. No, it doesn't. Okay, that's not an issue from Mr. Frasacci's perspective. It's the one on the northern, the northernmost one that he says you don't have an easement for right now. Okay, we, we don't have an easement for either right now. But you know, the plan doesn't show you need one for the second one. Right, we do need one here. Okay, absolutely, and that's that will be that we're adding. That. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What about the southerly lot? Um. The southerly lot, uh, we're, re we're replacing the culvert that's there now in the same alignment. Uh, the reason that we're going further uh, is be because of the grading again, the width of the roadway, to make it a town roadway. And we are matching grades as, uh, as best as possible through this whole area. And we do need to match existing driveways along, so we're, we're bound to certain grades there. And um, the town is going to own the roadway, and we're constructing their roadway the way they want it. Constructed. Dave. Mr. Chairman, I, it appears that there are going to be a number of issues that are going to be hashed out between the applicant and the town planner, and I'm wondering if we might want to just, uh, if, unless there are any real pressing questions, uh, table this to the next hearing so we can move, move things along. Sounds like a good idea. I have a motion? Barbara? I'm not making a motion. I have one more suggestion. And, and we'd appreciate and that, all the that, proposals. That is, that you meet with Mr. Fristashi both about that problem of the drainage on his land and also the business with the fill and how that might be equitably negotiated and have that answer for us the next time, too. Um, can I maybe add to that real quick? Um, on this lot here, there's actually 16 feet of grade across the lot. And we're putting in a roadway that's 6% because we. We don't want to go any steeper than that um, to meet the town standards. So if you have a six-foot grade going against 16 feet, you know, of slope change, it's going to be right on this end. It's, it's more like nine feet, and it's actually flush on this end. Kind of, um, if the house were down here on the lower part of the lot, yeah, the roadway would be would be above the home, and there would, if you wanted your home to be above the roadway, you'd have to bring in some fill. I, I, I just wanted to, to share that information. It's a situation that's there, um, and now we're putting in a roadway. I, I sort of think Barbara's idea was a good one, though. I think that Mr. Pistacci has got several sets of concerns, including, I believe he said he was not inclined for his granting easement for that one uh, drainage culvert. So I think you guys have to talk. Yep. And come back to us, hopefully, with some kind of agreement. Yep. We'll, we'll, uh, as you said, we'll hash that out between now and then. Do we have a second for the motion? You make it oh, I don't think I've made it yet. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Wishful thinking. Go, go ahead. A motion for the board to consider. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Cloutier construction for amendments to the previously approved Hamlin Street subdivision and a resource protection permit 
to reconfigure the road and lots into a non, excuse me, into a nine lot subdivision located at the end of Hamlin Street be tabled to the regular July 20, 2004 meeting of the Planning Board. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? That carries. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is Fort Williams Park Cliffwalk South Extension. Town of Cape Elizabeth requesting site plan review of the extension of the Cliffwalk in Fort Williams. And this is on for site plan completeness and a public hearing. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Planning Board members. My name is Tom Emery. I'm a landscape architect and a principal with Land Use Consultants in Portland. Uh, as you know, we've been working uh, at Fort Williams with the town and the Fort Williams Commission and the council for uh, over 10 years now. And uh, the plan in front of us is a culmination of the extension of the cliff walk and the improvements around uh, the Portland Headlight. The Portland Headlight Walk uh, is a more recent uh, 2001 uh, improvement, as well as the um, Battery Blair Memorial, to which all of this will eventually uh, connect. Uh, the project was also included as part of the 19, uh, 2003 Master Plan Update, uh, page 77 by coincidence. Um, if you'd like, I can give you a brief overview of the project and hit on some of the key points. That'd be fine. Okay, thank you. The uh, plan on the left, uh, the, the lighthouse isn't shown purposely because it's not part of this, this application. It's been previously approved. Atlantic Ocean, Casco Bay is to the right. Merriman Road is here. This is Battery Blair. This is the headlight parking lot. And this is Battery Garage. And the residential neighborhood is uh, down here. Uh, Currently, the Portland Headlight Walk comes into an area here. There are a couple of binoculars and terminates just south of those two binoculars with a wonderful overlook of the Portland Headlight. The proposal is to uh, continue the same treatment that we have at the uh, Cliff Walk North, which is a six-foot wide aggregate pathway, extending it south along uh, the fence line. And uh, in this area here that we refer to as a north overlook, there's an existing uh, concrete structure and uh, a wide eroded area and then a ledgy or rock rubble fill area and we're looking to create a focal point there this is one of the prime viewing uh, locations for photographing and overlooking uh, the headlight and then continuing along following almost the fence line but moving uh, away from it enough uh, at least six feet and to have somewhat of an irregular alignment for interest uh, follow uh, subtly uh, past what we refer to and is documented as the mounds, which is the old uh, rifle range uh, back, back up. I think during our uh, workshop meeting, we talked about the path perhaps going on the water side of the, that mound. We had a site walk with the town manager, the public works director, and the chair of the, uh, Mr. Barthelman, chair of the Fort Williams Commission. 
and due to uh, extensive excavation it would have to occur in the north end of that in a precipitous drop at that location it was decided that we would stay on the easterly side of the mounds as we head south but once we got past the southerly end of it we would then uh, head back uh, up north and east so to speak to what we refer to as the south overlook again that's fairly close to the uh, excuse me to the ledge uh, face so we're proposing to use a wood fence there would be very similar to the wood rail fence that's surrounding the Portland headlight area and uh, additionally some uh, shrubs uh, one of the concerns about the mound uh, is that there's obviously people use it that's a great vantage point but there are a lot of eroded pathways uh, on top and crossing the mound and particularly about uh, two-thirds or a little more than halfway along its length to the south is a very deep eroded swale that's extremely unstable and is and actually uh, quite a concern to have people walking up here and then coming down over that and that's one of the reasons uh, it was elected to, to surround this overlook area with a wood fence. Uh, from there we would continue south and uh, according to the old aerial photo uh, base map that we have from the fort there were two uh, walkways or roadways, one which went uh, back to Merriman Road along the north side of Battery Garche, then one that went to the east side and connected back into Merriman Road here. And uh, what we're going to do, although we didn't find evidence of those necessarily, we did find there is a path in here now, an eroded, uh, beaten path. Uh, we are going to follow an alignment uh, through the woods behind the battery. Again, there's a wonderful wall here, stone wall, uh, that makes up part of the battery. We'll stay about six feet away from that and work in the field around the trees. Uh, and additionally, uh, the, the walk along the north side of the battery terminates to a set of beautiful stone steps that then go up either to the battery blare or up to the uh, multi-purpose field area. Uh, that's really the, the project in a nutshell. Uh, we are including several mound areas that can be fine-tuned in the field. The reason for that is twofold. One, we'll have uh, material that we're taking up as we excavate for the trail itself, but it'll also provide some edge and interest to the, uh, the trail because everything else is wide open and flat, and it'll play off the mounds here. They'll be very low, two to three feet, uh, but long in an area to add some indigenous landscaping uh, that we've used elsewhere uh, throughout the park. There's no additional parking. Uh, it's just it's a simple uh, walkway project with uh, two overlooks and be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Okay, again, just to remind the board, the first issue we have to deal with is completeness, so we can go with that first. Yes, okay. <coughs> any other questions on the issue of completeness? Um, There's just one item in the town yeah. planner's mem memo about the signage. Mm -hmm. Has that issue been addressed? Uh, not specifically. Uh, we have signage from the, uh, the, the north uh, cliff walk that we would use in a similar uh, design uh, on the south cliff walk. The, the idea is actually to keep the signage to an absolute minimum uh, so that people are able to enjoy the park more and, and see less of uh, the signage. But it would do as the uh, north uh, trail sign does. It would identify the slope and in general length of the, the trail so people uh, with accessibility issues are, are able to uh, use the trail. So, so there will be some moderate or minimum amount of signage? No more than two of those metal plaques or, or something similar to those. And those will be included on the final? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. We have a motion on completeness? Yes, Peter. Uh, I have a motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for site plan review for the cliff walk south extension, the construction of a trail along the shoreline of Fort Williams Park south of the Portland headlight uh, be deemed complete, including the uh, signage amendments as offered by the applicant. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Um, at this point, I'd like to open what will be a very brief public hearing <laughs> uh, and let the record reflect that there appears to be no one in the room to give comments, so we will close the public hearing. 
and uh, move on to discussion of the application. Questions? Dave, you had a question? Yeah. I guess I just had one question. Um, regarding the second overlook, mm -hmm. you've got a firm there. I haven't seen it personally, but is there any thought in putting some vegetation there to help keeping people off it so that it doesn't erode anymore? Uh, at the second overlook? Yeah. This is a, uh, an enlargement of that second overlook. Here's the main uh, north-south extension. Here's the south end of the, of the berm. Uh, the berm has um, sumac covering the west side of it. Coming around this side of the, the berm, um, in addition to the fence, which runs all the way around, we also have Rosa Ragosa going around and daylilies. I meant from the berm that would tend to um, stifle one's attempt to cross the berm and then get to the overlook. You mean from the west side? Yes. We hadn't considered doing that, no. What we were going, what as we've described, we're going to take all of those eroded areas, take the material that we've excavated during the construction of the base of the trail and use that to fill in all those eroded areas and then plant that with probably a fescue or a wild grass that'll have a very naturalized look to it. That's the only question, right? Um, did, you, uh, did you suggest that uh, are you replacing the channel link fence with a wooden fence? No. There's the area that uh, where this overlook occurs, there is no fence at, at the present time. So rather than just put in a chain link fence, that's an area that's going to be a focal point. We thought it more appropriate to use uh, the same fence treatment as there is at the headlight, which is a combination of the chain link mesh against the uh, wooden fence, the rail fence. Oh, Barbara. From the sound of it, you're using landscaping that is native to the area. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, oh, sorry, Dave. Mr. Chairman, I, um, Tom, the only concern I had was safety, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you've looked that over. That's um, one of the three major purposes of this is to be sure that it's safe, as safe as the park can be. Uh, I, I've been out there many, many times, and I'm never surprised by what I see. Uh, well, actually, I am. Um, but the existing trail uh, from this point all the way along where there's a, a sharp drop-off all the way to the mounds is, does have that old chain-link fence that's in place. And what we had proposed to do during construction is to take a length of snow fence and cross off that while well, we've, we've uh, over seated the eroded area, we're going to take some uh, snow fence and, and block access at the south end of that. Uh, and then uh, we intentionally kept the trail back from the edge here. We're, there's a, there was a picture in the, in the documents. There was a, there's an old fir tree in this location. Rather going to the right of it, which would be closer to the edge, we're going to the left and, and closer to the trail. Wherever we had a, an opportunity of moving it closer or farther back was decided to hold it back rather than put it closer. We also um, looked at possible access points that we decided not to include simply for that reason, the, the concerns with safety. Other questions? Yes, Jack. Uh, Tom, I've heard reports of visual artists climbing the fence and going out for the rocks. Will anything be changed as far as how they might be impacted? About how, how they might access the rocks? About how what they do right now might be impacted. Uh, the, are you talking specifically in the area to the east of the mounds? No, further north. Uh, no, there's nothing, there's nothing about this design that's going to alter people's um, okay. habits in terms of using the park. No um, barbed wire or anything? No, this... <laughs> We can only make the earth so flat and so soft, and other than that, it's really another issue. A motion? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> motion for the board to consider a motion for approval 
findings of fact that the town of Cape Elizabeth is proposing to extend the cliff walk in Fort Williams Park along the shoreline south of Portman Headlight, which requires site plan review under section 19-9. Plan includes plantings along the path. The application substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted, and the facts presented, the application of the Town of Cape Elizabeth for site plan review for cliff walk extension, the construction of the trail along the shoreline of Fort Williams Park, South Portland Headlight, be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the total quantities for each proposed planting species be specified prior to bidding of the project. Moved and seconded. You have all that? All in favor? None opposed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank Cameron. you very much. Uh, the final item on the agenda. Two? Hang on. <laughs> Sorry. The next item on the agenda. The penultimate. Item. My personal favorite, the Paper Street vacation issue. And not to cut discussion short on this, but we, just to remind the board, that we have had more than one workshop on this, lots of discussion, lots of input. Um, so uh, I think we need to be ready to make a recommendation to the town council. Uh, who, who will, of course, ultimately make the decision here. Ultimately, unless they send it back <laughs> once again to us. <laughs> um, Barbara. I have one suggestion that we add a width to the easement for Overlook Lane, a width for that ingress and egress over that, over Mr. Um, I'm sorry, I can't find his name in a hurry, it's lot. Mr. Panansky. Yes, thank you. I think we need to specify a minimum width that the town will be satisfied with. That would be on page two at the bottom under paragraph yeah. B. The width of Overlook Lane is 15 feet. Is, is that going to be satisfactory to the fire chief? Right now he, does have, he doesn't have anything. Um, I don't know how many of you have traveled over that little driveway, but it is very tight. And there's not a lot of room on either side of it because there are existing structures. The problem is that I think the fire chief points out something that's relevant, and that is if there's ever a fire in there and he can't get in and out because he has no way to get out, it's going to be a problem. So as my understanding is as things exist now, he doesn't have a way at all, correct? Right. He has to go around. And I think you all have a map on the last page that should make it a little easier to discuss this. But right now, his, act, his legal access is off of Wombeck Road. So you go all the way down Trundy Road, and then um, just before it turns into Reef Road, you take a left on Wombeck and then a left on Overlook Lane, and that is the only legal access that he currently has. Yeah, that's not saying that in an emergency, fire chief isn't going to drive his vehicle right up the driveway that Mr. Pnansky has on his property, but it's, I don't know, I don't know if it's, if it's too tight for the ladder truck, to be quite frank. But, but I understand your issue in, in the perfect world, absolutely, but right now um, we're asking, we're, we're basically negotiating a, a trade with Mr. Pnansky, and I guess the board has to decide whether they want to have an equivalent trade or whether they want to recommend a trading up. 
I we personally don't, don't think it's too much to ask for the easement to be the 15 feet of the little lane. I really don't. I mean, he is gaining land. And we're asking him to give up some land in an easement. He can still use the lot. For, he's already promised not to build on it, I believe. Or he will as part of this. Or, Maureen, what are the structures that might impede a 15-foot right-of-way? Is it a garage or is it a shed? McDuffie. how far over the plane or how suggested to the council how far over the plane should come we haven't stipulated the exact point where over the plane should end that garage can't take up that whole lot surely there has to be room on one side or the other the other person's house is irrelevant because we're not talking about their lot I'm, I'm not saying that I disagree with your proposal I'm just not certain there's physically enough space. So that garage is covering that whole little lot? No, but it's it's extremely close to to where the road is. That's that's the problem. I mean, the proximity from the, the driveway to the garage, to the Madigan house and garage, and to Mr. Penanzi's house is very close. So, you know, if there's enough room, great. Um, no one is actually gone out there and measured it, so that's why I'm uncertain. Certainly, you could you could put in. All right. So the the Barbara, your current proposal would be to require fifteen feet on Overlook Lane for the easement that would be granted by Mr. Penansky as part of this entire proposal. And you're saying maybe we should say, if possible, 15 feet, because we don't know. No, you can say 15 feet, absolutely. It's just you're making a recommendation of the council, so right. if there's not enough room, they'll, they'll adjust it. 
Okay. Any other comments? I would, I would support that change to uh, 1B. Okay. At least 15 feet. Yes. Okay. I, I have been up there. It is tight. And I... Did you find the fire chief's... I did. Memo? Yes. So um, he's really concerned about it. Right. Well, are there any other concerns that we want to address before we finalize our recommendation? No. I'm pleased with it at this point. Okay. Uh, let me just note for the record, too, that Mr. Keneally has recused himself, right, just so we know uh, on the record, and we will continue with the remaining board. Somebody want to take a try at a motion? Barbara? Motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the maps and the information presented, the planning board recommends to the town council the following Paper Street vacations. Overlook Lane being that portion extending east from Katahdin Road extension to a point 15 feet from the extension of the easterly property line of lot U12-42 Penansky with the following conditions. That a deed restriction be placed on lot U12-42 Penansky. That any access or utility extension from that lot or lots that originate from that lot be from Overlook Lane. B that rights of emergency access and pedestrian access for the residents in the subdivision um, be conveyed to the town of Cape Elizabeth over the minimum 15-foot traveled way located on lot U12-37 in Nansky. C, that easements be conveyed to any other utilities that currently have infrastructure in Overlook Lane. Two, Elizabeth Road being that portion located north of Trundy Road. Three, Katahdin Road extension being that portion extending from Trundy Road to Highview Road with the following conditions. A, that the town of Cape Elizabeth reserve to itself rights for a pedestrian easement over the full width of Katahdin Road extension to be used at a future date to create a five-foot wide pedestrian pathway connecting Trundy Road to Highview Road. B, that an easement for existing water lines located in Katahdin Road be provided to the Portland Water District. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Opposed? That carries. Uh, four to one. All right. Five to one. Now, last Four to one. No, four to one. I'm sorry. Now, this is our last agenda item, right? No, no more hiding. Uh, town Council has referred to the Planning Board a request to amend the zoning ordinance to allow phasing of open space zoning subdivisions with an amendment to Section 19-7-2 of the zoning ordinance and 19-10-3 zoning ordinance amendments. Uh, again, we discussed this briefly at our last workshop. If you remember, the concern here was for applicants having to go through the time and expense of putting together an entire plan for their entire parcel when they may not be developing their entire parcel at the time of the application. Um, any further thoughts on that, on this issue? I'd just like to compliment our, our staff member, Maureen, for the very well-written amendment. That must mean there's a motion coming. Uh, yeah. I have formulated some opinions, but it seems to me we ought to wait to 
have the public hearing and then have a discussion at that point. So unless there's a desire to have a discussion now, I'm happy to propose a motion for the board. Be it ordered that based on the information submitted and the facts presented, the open space zoning amendment section 19-7-2B to allow phasing of developments with submission of a concept plan be tabled to the regular July 20, 2004 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing shall be held. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Very good. Thank you. For the board's information, I will be sending this to the town attorney prior to the public hearing so he can review it and provide his comments. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Adjourn. Thank you.